Hello, welcome. Uh, I'm delighted today to be joined by the brilliant Omar Bartov, who's the Samuel P. Sarr Professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Brown University, a very accomplished uh, scholar who's been writing a lot um, ever since on, on, on the horrors which have um, enveloped Gaza and Israel since the 7th of October. Um, Omar, hello, firstly, great to see you. How you doing in these difficult times? Hi. Um, I just want to start by just the question of genocide, which is a live discussion when it comes to what's happening in Gaza. I interviewed uh, Rassi Gal, who I know you know, who's an associate professor of um, genocide and Holocaust studies, um, who thinks that this is a textbook genocide. Um, and I suppose the argument he makes is that it's rare for intent to be so openly stated. Um, rhetoric like quoting genocidal passages about Amalek in the Bible, in which the Israelites are commanded to kill all men, women, children, babies, livestock. Um, you know, there were no innocents in Gaza. Um, uh, the, there were two million wet Nazis in the West Bank. Just you know, it's it's rare um, in 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 these sorts of horrors for that kind of intent to be said. It's normally covered up in other ways. So I'm just interested what your thoughts are on that as a gen as another genocide scholar on the question of genocide. So look, uh, first, uh, thanks for having me. Um, I, I wrote a few weeks ago already uh, on my sense that there was a danger of genocide occurring uh, in Gaza. Uh, and I mentioned the fact that um, peculiarly, if, if you like, uh, Israeli political and military leaders, people with executive power, uh, had been making statements as of October 7th, um, right at the beginning of this, um, that had that echoed genocidal intent. Um, we should wipe them out. They are human animals. Uh, we should flatten Gaza. Uh, we should remove the population from Gaza, and so forth. And there was a kind of uh, slippery slope between speaking about Hamas and speaking about Gazas in general. Uh, most Gazas are refugees, are Palestinian refugees from 1948, and their descendants. Uh, so that is, in truth, um, exceptional because often regimes carry out genocide uh, while trying to present it it's something else. And here you had people with executive power making statements that could be interpreted as genocidal. But that's not enough to establish that a genocide is going on. Uh, you also need to see that it's happening on the ground. So there has to be a link between statements and actions. Um, and in the case of Israeli uh, military actions, uh, my own thinking is that what we see right now is very likely, very likely um, war crimes uh, because of the great disproportionality between uh, civilian and military or combatant uh, losses. We are talking about almost, it seems, 20,000 people have been killed. And according to the IDF spokesperson himself, uh, two out of three uh, people killed are civilians. Uh, he was sort of tapping himself on the, on the shoulder when he said that, but that means 10, 12,000 civilians killed, uh, the majority of whom are women and children. Uh, so there is evidence um, that there may be war crimes being carried out that may also indicate crimes against humanity, um, extermination of large numbers of civilians. In order for it to be genocide, you have to show that there is an intent in the operations to target specifically uh, Palestinians as such. That's part of the genocide definition. Are they being targeted as Palestinians as such, not as excessive collateral damage? And to my mind, what is most um, troubling right now, and that has developed since I last wrote about it, uh, is that about 1.8 million Palestinians out of 2.2 or 2.3 have been displaced. They've been displaced, they've been concentrated in a very small territory. Uh, their homes have largely been destroyed. The Israeli army and, and uh, government have not committed to allowing them back and they're now in conditions that are creating an ever-widening humanitarian disaster. 
And there is a great deal of talk in Israel about removing them entirely from Gaza, which would indicate that this is an operation of ethnic cleansing, as one Israeli minister, Dichter, said, uh, this is Nakba 2023. That is Nakba for the disaster of 1948, the expulsion of 750,000 Palestinians in 1948. Uh, ethnic cleansing often deteriorates into genocide because people don't want to move. And so in order to encourage them to move, you kill them. Uh, and so we are, I think, right now at a point where ethnic cleansing seems to have been carried out and is ongoing, and it may become genocidal. I've been interested a lot in terms of the precedence in the wars of the Balkans in the 1990s, and there's many, many differences in terms of dynamics, in terms of history. But I am interested in the case of the Bosnian Serbs and the uh, Bosnian Serb armies, I should say, to distinguish between civilians. But, you know, the, the Serbs suffered genocide in World War II at the hands of the Ustashi, the Croatian um, collaborators who, frankly, the Nazis um, often, you know, kind of shocked the Nazis with their, with their sheer depravity. Um, and they exterminated Jews and Serbs. Um, and that became something of a pillar of modern Serb nationalism, which is we were exterminated in the past, and therefore we have to, we if we don't kill, we will be killed instead. And that very much informed the approach of the Bosnian Serbs in the Bosnian War when they feared being basically submerged in what they regarded as an Islamist state. Um, and they suffered atrocities, Bosnian Serbs, really terrible atrocities, in the way that Israeli civilians also suffered terrible atrocities on the 7th of October. I just wondered, do you think there's a parallel there? Because none of that, we don't look at the, what the the history of the Bosnian Serbs in any way to, to 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 justify what they were found guilty of, which is genocide, um, specifically in Srebrenica in 1995. So, just is there is there parallels there between the Bosnian Serbs and Israel, even though there are differences in history and dynamics? Well, I mean, I think that there are parallels between that, and I would say more generally. There's a parallel in the sense that um, uh, groups that engage in um, a great deal of violence against other groups often do that because they see themselves as victims. Uh, and they see themselves very often as victims of those groups that they're killing. Um, and so this kind of cycle of making um, uh, of, of victims becoming perpetrators uh, you can actually take it back to the Germans who saw themselves as the great victims of World War I and the, of, the, of, the, of the peace, the, the unjust peace after World War I and of the stab in the back by the socialists and the Jews as they saw it. And that was the main incentive then or, or, or the main excuse by the Nazis to carry out mass crimes in World War II. Uh, the Serbs are an interesting case because um, uh, Serbia... Uh, is seen in uh, Israeli uh, in the Israeli view uh, as a country that fought against the Nazis, and Tito was seen as a great leader next to Stalin as having fought as uh, partisans and sacrificed huge numbers of people uh, in World War II against the Nazis, and so they were um, your enemy's enemy. Uh, and uh, in that sense, there was always a great deal of sympathy for Serbia. And during the 1990s, during the wars in the former Yugoslavia, uh, Israeli sentiment was generally on the side of the Serbs. So, so that is sort of one side of it. Uh, I would say that in Israel, the main memory obviously is not that of the Serbs. The main memory is the memory of the Holocaust. And that has been evoked repeatedly uh, since October 7th, um, Israeli state um, information propaganda tried to first talk about uh, Hamas as being ISIS and say Hamas is ISIS. It didn't, certainly for the Israeli public, it wasn't that effective. And so now they're basically called the Nazis. Uh, if you listen to Israeli TV, everybody's talking about Hamas Nazis. And that triggers everything in Israeli society, fear, hate, and license to carry out uh, unlimited violence because the Nazis obviously are those who murdered the Jews in World War II. And if you can identify Hamas, 
uh, not only Hamas, all the Gazans, as the Israeli president said, I mean, they're all guilty as Nazis, then whatever you do to them is legitimate. And that's, that's the main danger of using these kind of uh, historical analogies. I mean, on that, actually, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, basically. I mean, did I get this wrong, basically? I mean, this was so, – because I got a lot of critique from, I'd say – Jewish, some Jewish leftists, anti-Zionists, for something I wrote a week after the 7th of October, um, when various commentators were saying, particularly Jewish commentators in Britain were saying, everyone's forgotten about 7th of October, now we're talking about Gaza, uh, as though this was a trick pulled by opponents of Gaza rather than we were just responding mm. to what was happening in Gaza. But I said, last Saturday, Hamas engaged in the biggest mass murder of Jews since the Holocaust. Jewish people everywhere are understandably grieving and traumatised. Those of us opposing the mass slaughter in Gaza aren't belittling this. We just don't want more innocent people to die. And I was trying to engage with people saying that in the sense of trauma and grief people felt. But many felt I'd made a big mistake there because I shouldn't have invoked the question of the Holocaust, suggested that the attack was driven by anti-Semitism um, and that legitimized the idea that this was a war against Nazism. So, yeah, I guess that's self-critique. Is that is that a valid critique, basically? Look, I mean, it's it's a really tricky issue, I must say, uh, and and I've been trying to uh, think about this as rationally and reasonably as I can as well. Uh, the, when when people say that the Hamas massacre of October seventh is the largest killing of Jews since the Holocaust. Statistically, it may be true, although I think about 1,500 uh, people are estimated to have been killed in Poland after World War II in Pogrom. So it's not necessarily true. Uh, but the use of the word after the Holocaust immediately evokes the memory of the Holocaust. And that memory of the Holocaust, as I said before, can be abused. It can be used to give you license. Now, one has to add that there are... Um, people who uh, are critical of Israeli policies, and I'm certainly one of them, who uh, avoid talking about Hamas. They start off right after the Hamas massacre and go directly into the Israeli attack on Gaza. Now, Gaza was under siege by Israel. The entire phenomenon of Hamas is a product of Israeli occupation policies, 56 years of occupation since 67. Mm -hmm. So, yes, there is a larger context, but you cannot avoid speaking about the Hamas attack and the huge effect that it had on Israel. I'm, I'm constantly in touch with friends in Israel, and they are shattered by what mm -hmm. happened. I mean, this had an effect on my own family. There's hardly anyone who was not affected by what happened on October 7th. Um, and the sense of insecurity and fear in Israel, quite apart from the fact that the government is so totally incompetent at the moment. And so if you want to understand what is going on and how both Palestinians and Israelis see what is happening, you cannot uh, simply start right after the Hamas attack. You have to include that in the discussion. And that reminds me to some extent of 1948, because Israelis... Jewish Israelis like talking about the War of 1948 as the War of Independence. And yes, there was some collateral damage that the Palestinians fled, and that was not such a bad thing from the point of view of Israelis. And Palestinians like talking about 1948 as only the Nakba, as if there was no war. And, you know, my parents fought in that war, and large numbers of their friends were killed in that war. So it was experienced by uh, Jews there, who then became Israeli Jews when the state was established, as a very traumatic war. You have to include both these together, both in order to understand why people do what they do, and more importantly, to understand where do you go forward. You cannot go forward without understanding the way the other side thinks. If you only see it through your own prism, you are imprisoned in that, and you can never move forward. And that's basically the bane of both sides at the moment. I'm, I'm interested to just kind of link to that, the question of anti-Semitism, which is ingrained in European, well, not just European cu culture, but just, just, you know, 2,000 years ingrained in European culture, um, you know, which we had expulsions, blood libel, pogroms, culminating, of course, in the attempt to exterminate the entire Jewish population of Europe in, within living memory, which is, I think, important to always emphasise. Um 
And at the same time, there is a attempt to deliberately stigmatize any form of solidarity with the Palestinians as anti-Semitism. Um, and I just wondered how we, the best way in a, the kind of empathetic way I think you're talking about here, how we disentangle that. We take anti-Semitism very seriously and we should always take anti-Semitism extremely seriously um, whilst demarcating from these claims of anti-Semitism, which are not round, grounded in, in, in fact and actually have a very obvious purpose. Look, I mean, I, I can I can think about that personally. I mean, the reason that I was born in Israel uh, was that my mother and her family left Eastern Europe, uh, then Poland, now Ukraine, in 1935. Uh, everybody else who stayed there, my entire family, was murdered. And so from that point of view, had my mother and her parents stayed there, I would not have been here. Um, so the, the, the sort of at the core, of what uh, the state of Israel is, is a sense that in the 1930s, in the 1940s, there was no safe haven to Jews. Nobody wanted to take them in. It's not just that the Nazis wanted to kill them. The Nazis actually wanted to displace them. They wanted to hand them over to somebody else, but nobody wanted them. And so they were killed. And so there is a kind of existential sense about the importance of there being an Israeli state. But that does not give that state license to oppress and, and, and occupy and kill people. Uh, the same thing uh, is with Palestinians. Palestinians um, um, have a, a right uh, to self-determination, a right to their own country, a right to their own dignity and justice. Uh, that does not give them license to massacre Jews. So one massacre does not justify another. The massacre of the Nazis does not give Jews the right to massacre Palestinians. And oppression of Palestinians, which should be res resisted by Palestinians, does not give Palestinians the right to carry out such massacres as Hamas did. We have to understand that what you have now in Israel, in Palestine, are two national movements. You have 7 million Palestinians, you have 7 million Jews living between the Jordan and the sea. They can either find a way to share that space or they will keep killing each other, which they're doing at larger and larger numbers. They, every time there's a round of violence, it's more violent, the, the cost in blood is greater. Uh, and so to me, we have to understand the past. We have to understand where people are coming from, but we have to also look forward. And yes, there is a rise in anti-Semitism around the world. Anti-Semitism is, is a pernicious um, sentiment that dates, you know, to antiquity. Unfortunately, Israel that was created in large part as a response to anti-Semitism is these days one of the main triggers of anti-Semitism around the world. It legitimates people who have anti-Jewish sentiments because of its own policies um, against Palestinians. And had there been, and if there is, a settlement between the two groups, anti-Semitism will not go away, but I actually think that it will be diminished. I saw actually just linked to that, and I forget her name, so I, 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 but to sum up something along the lines she wrote, she was a, a dissident okay, leftist Israeli. Um, and she said that Zionists had to contend with the fact that Israel had not made Jews more safe. Do you think that's true? Is that the, 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 the you know, since since the war, you made the point actually in the 30s, your family wouldn't have survived if they hadn't have emigrated to what was then the British Mandate of Palestine. But in terms of since 1948, do you think that is true? Look, I mean, I think uh, numerically, um, you could say that right now, uh, Israel is not a particularly safe place for Jews. Uh, there are Jews in America, Jews in France, Jews in Germany who say that they feel threatened. Uh, but in terms of numbers of Jews actually dying from violent actions, uh, yes, I think uh, it, it's you know numerically true. But I would add that the whole idea of Zionism was not simply to make... Uh, uh, to create a Jewish state where Jews would be safe, but to create a Jewish state where all the authorities would be Jewish. 
Uh, that is where the government would be Jewish, the army, the police, a place where pogroms could not occur, which are actions carried out against minorities um, by mobs or by governments. Uh, now, you can have all of that and yet elect the wrong leaders, have the wrong policy. And if you do that, uh, think about Britain in World War I. It went to a war where an entire generation was decimated. Was that an argument against Britain being an independent state? No, it was an argument against having foolish policies. And so I think that the, the question is not whether a Jewish state is safe for Jews, but whether a Jewish government in a Jewish state conducts the right policies or not. And over a long stretch of time, Israel has had really bad governments, not least the 20, the last 20 years under Netanyahu has been the worst leader Israel has ever had. And I would argue fundamentally anti-Zionist leader who has completely undermined what the um, original ideal of Zionism was. Um Zippy Ottavelli is the Israeli ambassador to Britain, not what I would describe as a polished media performer, unlike her predecessor, Mark Regev, who is an extremely slick media performer, um, I would say. Uh, but she is um, a, 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 quite a crude performer, if I'm honest. Um, and she says something which was, you know, in an interview um, with Sky News in which she was asked about the prospect of a two-state solution and she said, absolutely not. And in some ways that's not really a shock because actually Benj Benjamin Netanyahu, etc., have made that very, very clear over and over again. But it's just, you know, some people made the point that where Sky News had failed there uh, was to say, well, what does that actually mean in practical terms? Because what does that mean for the Palestinians who live between the river and the sea? Um, because in practice, does that mean what never ending apartheid, ethnic cleansing? I mean, that, that is, I just interested because in practice, you know, we hear a lot of the moral panic about from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, but a, a state is being built from the river to the sea. Um, so what do you think about the actual logical implication of that Israeli policy? What that means, given there is two and a half million or two, there were 2.2 .2 million uh, people in Gaza. It's going to be less than that unfortunately, by the end of this, and around 3 million Palestinians in the West Bank. And obviously within Israeli society, there's a, around 2 million Palestinian citizens. So what, what's your thoughts on what that actually means? So first of all, from the river to the sea is not an original Palestinian slogan. If you look at the nationality law that was passed in Israel only a few years ago, it basically claims that the whole Eretz Israel, all of the land of Israel, is the national home of the Jews. Uh, and, and if you think about the sort of origins of this term, it goes back to Zionist revisionism, you know, so which had a song that went, uh, the river has two banks and this bank belongs to us and the other one too. Uh, so they're actually thinking also about Transjordan as being part of the greater Israel. Uh, so that slogan means who is saying it and, and, and what do they intend? What's, what's, what's the meaning of what they use? Now, yes, in terms of what you are saying, if there is no a two-state solution, what are the alternatives, right? Uh, one alternative is that it would be a binational state. Uh, and there was talk about that in the 1930s. It disappeared after 1948. What is a binational state? There would be equal numbers of Jews and Palestinians. They'd have the same rights. Uh, it would be a state of all its citizens, as was said during the Oslo Accord was the kind of main slogan. Now, most Jews don't want that, and most Palestinians don't want that, because Jews want a right of self-determination and a right of return. And Palestinians want a right of self-determination and a right of return. Uh, and in order to do that, you need two states. Uh, if you don't have a binational state and you don't have two states, what you have is apartheid. Uh, and that is a regime that exists right now in the West Bank. You have two groups of people living under, under two different uh, systems of law. You have between 500,000 and 750,000 Jews, Jewish settlers, and 3 million Palestinians. They live under a different law. And the law for Palestinians gives them hardly any rights because it's military law. Uh, so how do you uh, circle this, uh, square this circle? Uh, I would say that, you know, Netanyahu in the past actually talked about two states. He was forced to do it uh, under uh, American pressure. Uh, he's now relented. Uh, 
basically, it would mean pushing Palestinians out. This is, I think, what is underlying what's going on in Gaza now and what is going on now under the radar in the West Bank. The people on his right, um, the, the Smotrich and Ben Gvirs uh, in his cabinet, are uh, Jewish supremacists. They are people who want to have the whole territory, Gaza very much included, possibly parts of Lebanon as well, with Jewish settlers and with as few Palestinians as possible. I think there is another way to think about it. I think one can create two states, but that would have to be in a confederation. It would have to be uh, two states that would be along the 1967 borders, but where you would make a distinction between citizenship and residence, and where people could be citizens of one state and reside in another as long as they respect its laws and regulations. Uh, that would prevent the kind of civil war that would break out if Israel tried to remove the settlers, if it had a government that was willing to do so. And it would enable Palestinians who would come back with the right of return to a Palestinian state also in limited numbers to go and live where their ancestors had lived in towns that are now in the state of Israel as residents rather than as citizens voting for their own parliament. Uh, and in that sense, it would be, yeah, I know it sounds as a pipe dream now, but it would be like a French person. Now the Brits can't do that anymore, but uh, a French uh, person going to live in Berlin or a German going to live in Paris, uh, you would retain your citizenship, but you would be allowed to reside in the nearby country. I mean, just in terms of, I guess, the, the, the how plausible that, that ends up being. Mark Regov, who I mentioned now, obviously he's a spokesperson for the Israeli government who does the media tour, um, making the case for, well, a, 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 a slick case for the slaughter currently taking place in Gaza. But the point, I thought he made quite a revealing um, comment in an interview last week um, in which following the current um, Israeli ambassador, uh, Zippy Hotovelli, saying there'd be no two-state solution, and he's pressed on that, and he said, well, actually, Yitzhak Rabin, who signed the former Israeli prime minister, who signed the Oslo Accords, himself said that Palestine would always have an entity less than a state um, to make the point. And I thought it was interesting because that there's a myth often propagated that the Palestinians have had lots of opportunities to have a state, which they, they've turned down and they've basically brought their own fate upon themselves. But that was quite revealing. And it just made me think, well, how plausible is it ever to have even, you know, because no people would ever really, back, there's not really a precedent for any people on earth accepting an entity less than a state. It basically looks like a Bantu stand in South Africa. So what do you think in terms of how this changes? Because a lot of Israeli opinion has just hardened quite dramatically. It's not like South Africa under apartheid where public opinion globally shifted and that made white South Africans actually often very, very reluctantly having to come to the conclusions that apartheid was not going to last. But there's no incentive for that. And therefore, Israeli society just hardens and hardens and hardens because, you know, and, and that therefore the idea of any viable Palestinian state of any description just seems impossible. Look, first of all, I think the, 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 there's some room for analogy with South Africa, but there's also a huge difference because, as I said, uh, Palestinians want a state of their own. Yeah. And Jews want a state of their own. And mm -hmm. both groups have an absolute right to have that said. If you read the Palestinian Declaration of Independence and the Israeli Declaration of Independence, they're, they're very similar. And they claim historical rights for self-determination. Uh, so you have to start from that. Um, a lot of um, uh, Jewish Israelis think really about Palestinians in a kind of colonial terminology. They think of them as being the natives and how do we deal with these natives who are you know, uh, primitive and violent and um, maybe we can use them for labor and so forth, but by and large, it would be good if they just went away. Um, the, do we, is the is there room for a uh, uh, for an independent, fully uh, sovereign Palestinian state? There has to be. It it has to happen, uh, and it can happen. I think, in fact, through a, a a federative system. Most Israelis think about um, 
sharing the space in terms of there being barbed wire and minefields between one and another. They talk, and, and this is not only Netanyahu, this goes back indeed, truly, to uh, labor governments, talking about separation, afrada. This was the whole concept. Let's separate between them. We, they want to have their own space, let them go there, we'll build a wall, we'll build a fence. These walls and fences don't work. We saw that on October 7th. And I think much of the Israeli public um, can now move in one direction or another. There are people in Israel now who are promoting uh, Israel become like Sparta, become even more militaristic, live on its sword, know that this is its fate. There are people who've said that since before 1948. That's one sort of brand of Zionism. And that would be a miserable state. Uh, it would be a poor state. It would be a state that nobody would want to have anything to do with. The other option is to say, well, we have now realized, finally, we have to change the political paradigm. The political paradigm that we had was how do we manage this conflict with the Palestinians? We don't want to solve it. We don't need to solve it because we are too strong. They can't do anything to us. They can lob a few rockets at us. But beyond that, we can control it. And then came October 7th. And with all the sort of heinous aspects of that, it has similarities with what happened in 1973 when Egypt and Syria attacked Israel. And Israel thought after 67, hey, we, we don't have to worry about the Arabs. Look, we beat them in six days. And only after October 73, in, in which I was a soldier and quite a number of my classmates were killed uh, needlessly, only after that, Israel said, okay, you know what? We'll give Egypt back the Sinai Peninsula and have peace with Egypt, which is the most important diplomatic event that happened for Israel since 1948, because Egypt is the largest, most powerful Arab country. Uh, now the same thing happened. It became clear Israel cannot manage the conflict. It can either carry out ethnic cleansing and genocide of the Palestinians, which I hope it will not be able to do, or it has to find a political solution that would give justice and dignity to both groups and safety. I think fundamentally both peoples want it. They have terrible leaders. Palestinians have terrible leaders, both the PA and Hamas, which is not really a partner for negotiations. And Israel has been electing Netanyahu now for decades a man who has proven himself, he was Mr. Security, has proven himself to be completely incompetent and was in charge of the largest disaster in Israeli history since the founding of the state. And just very finally on that, what's your, I guess, not best case scenario, your kind of most, most likely scenario, do you think, in, in, in terms of what happens next, given the rhetoric of the Israeli state, given the horror befalling Gaza. And it's interesting, the head of the uh, UN aid mission uh, in the Financial Times today pointed out that most people die in these situations, not from violence, because um, we see the, the the death toll in terms of violent deaths, but, but of hunger, the collapse of the health system. Mm. I mean, what, what, what do you think is likely to happen? Do you think it ends up, as things stand, with Gaza ethnically cleansed, just rendered inhospitable, for sustainable human life and then the israel hopes that maybe it falls off the radar and you have a gradual mass exodus of the survivors to other arab countries look it's possible that that would happen i um but i have to say uh we have to keep in mind the israeli army is a modern army with the, one of the most powerful air forces in the world with uh, with vast numbers of tanks and artillery uh, it's mobilized well over a quarter of a, a third of a million soldiers, and it's been fighting for weeks in Gaza, and it has still uh, probably killed about 20% of Hamas militants mm -hmm. and does not seem to have undermined the control of Hamas over the territory that it still is ruling. Mm -hmm. It's not been a successful military operation at all by any account and i don't think it can last much longer i think israel is running out of time and we have to remember uh, israel is heavily dependent on the united states obviously politically you know veto and the security council but also 
because it's receiving huge amounts of munitions for tanks, for artillery, and of course, rockets. Uh, the patience in the United States is running out. It also has to do with Biden. You know, who is going to be the next president of the United States? What Biden is doing right now uh, is not so good for his reelection. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that Israel is, is reaching the limits of its power. And I'm hoping that at the end of this, there will be an, a political earthquake in Israel. Netanyahu is very, very unpopular in Israel now. I think he would get probably 13% of the vote right now. Uh, whether a new leadership is created in Israel that will rethink this entire undertaking and a new leadership among Palestinians, which exists, but is mostly in Israeli jails, um, one can only hope. But uh, if we don't have a political horizon, then all we will see is more and more destruction. A sobering way to end. Um... I really, really appreciate it. Um, your insights, your thoughts. That was extremely uh, thoughtful, nuanced, also humane, which I always appreciate. Um, so those watching or listening, please like and subscribe. Do share the video. But I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you.